my name is Mike Gabe and welcome to mission 25 of this KSP campaign. As you may recall at the conclusion of the last episode, I mentioned that I wanted to up the quality of the spacecraft that I was putting into orbit. Well, surrounded by all these radial LFO boosters is my response, which we'll be looking at in more detail later. Why don't we start off with this lifter? This is a very different style of lifter than you've seen thus far. Actually, this vehicle represents somewhat of a compromise as my original idea was to lift this up on a stack of four strapped together 1.25 meter tanks, a style which I much prefer. It flew beautifully until about the 10 kilometer mark when it developed a stability problem. This is almost always due to the center of mass being too close to the center of drag. And because of the design of the orbiter, this has a lot of drag up top. I quickly abandoned this idea and went with six radially mounted LFO boosters instead. Though this design is often easier to build, I really do prefer the traditional tall rocket stack, and part of me regrets abandoning the idea so quickly. One of the things I didn't try doing was adjusting the fuel flow priority in the tanks to keep the mass as far forward as possible. It may have made the difference, but oh well. That all said, the ship does make use of the FTX-2 external fuel duct for the first time, a part that allowed me to do something a little different. Uh, asparagus staging. The idea is to run all engines at once, but to use fuel lines to direct the fuel flow so that all engines are running off the fuel in the tanks that are to be dropped first. This means that all the other tanks will still be full at the moment of each booster separation. The result is a substantial increase in the efficiency of your ascent. When doing this, don't forget to tweak the thrust on your engine so that you have the appropriate thrust to weight ratios after each staging. Also take note of the liberal applications of struts to stiffen the whole thing up. You've likely also noticed that the vehicle is currently uncrewed. Don't fret, that will be rectified soon enough, but one of the facts about this vehicle is that it is not designed to land back on Kerbin. In addition, most of the fuel tanks of the payload are currently empty to save weight. This will also be rectified later, but the result is that if something went wrong during this ascent, there would be no way to safely abort and return the crew to the surface in one piece. As such, the crew will be coming up in a separate, safer launch. Here you can see my test launch. I pressed F12 to turn on the aerodynamic overlay. The red lines are drag and you can see a large one coming from the central vehicle. I'm compensating for this by making my ascent steeper than normal to minimize the time in the thicker atmosphere. The drag and this ascent profile did make getting to orbit more expensive though. Indeed, the combined vacuum delta V of the six boosters is over 4100 meters per second compared to my more typical 35 to 3600 meters per second. We're almost out of the atmosphere. Let's lose the nose cone covering our docking port. So we'll pitch up. So get the nose cone out of the way and decouple. There we go, bye bye nose cone. All right, we better get back down to a pitch of zero because we're only about a minute away from our apoapsis. And while we're doing our low orbit insertion, I'll draw attention to the fact that I do have a target selected. That is the fuel for this thing. And I'll get to that soon enough as right now I'm busy bringing down my relative inclination with the target while raising my periapsis. We'll stage these final boosters while the periapsis is still in the atmosphere and then circularize with the orbiter. Actually, to be more precise, this is more than just a simple orbiter. I plan on doing quite a lot with this thing. I'm sure many people have already noticed the landing struts down there, but uh, first things first. As mentioned, most of the tanks are empty. Right now, I only have two Oscar B fuel tanks worth of fuel and oxidizer aboard. So I'm going to have to refuel it, and that means docking for the first time. This is my first vessel with a reaction control system, otherwise known as RCS. This fine control maneuvering system is powered by monopropellant held in two Stratus 5 roundified monopropellant tanks near the vehicle's waist, not to mention a bit of monoprop in the command can. Thrust is being provided by a set of RV-105 RCS thruster blocks and another set of four Place Anywhere 7 linear RCS ports. 
When placing RCS thrusters, there are a few things to think about. One, use enough of them so that you will get balanced thrust in all six directions, forward, aft, starboard, port, ventral, and dorsal. Two, try to position the thrusters on the widest parts of the ship, away from the central axis. This will maximize the torque you get when adjusting attitude, which is pitch, yaw, and roll. Finally, center lateral thrust around the center of mass of the ship, remembering that the center of mass will likely move as the fuel levels change. This will minimize the amount of torque on the ship when translating left-right or up-down. As the reaction wheels in KSP are pretty powerful, you can get away with being quite far from perfect, but a great mod for helping with all this is RCS Build Aid. It will give you torque, thrust, and even delta V in all directions and attitudes. I highly recommend it. I'm hoping this will be a workhorse for me for quite a while. As mentioned, it's not intended to land back on Kerbin, but will rather stay in space or I'll just keep refueling it. As for the details, well, I've got a lot planned for its inaugural mission. I think that will have to be an episode onto itself, so I'm going to leave the detailed description of this vessel for the next episode. But hang on, silly me, talked about the need for docking, but we haven't had a chance to meet our target yet. Obviously this was launched previously, but I didn't want to start the episode with this as, frankly, it's not as interesting a vessel. But we are being treated to this beautiful sunrise thanks to the Environmental Visual Enhancements mod. Essentially an orbiting fuel depot, but I really shouldn't be so dismissive. At over 140 tons, this is my largest launch to date and, as you can see, is my first vessel built mostly out of 2.5 meter parts. These parts include the Rockomax X200-8 and X200-32 fuel tanks, as well as the protective rocket nose cone Mark 7. Lifting it all are four skipper liquid fuel engines providing a combined thrust at launch of 2,275 kilonewtons. Coincidentally, this is also my first use of the smallest nose cone, the 0.625 meter small nose cone, which is protecting the 0.625 meter docking port at the top. Like the previous mission, I'm using radially mounted asparagus staged LFO boosters. The skipper engine doesn't have the thrust to carry this big a payload into orbit atop a vertical stack. I had a second set of reaction wheels at the bottom of that central tank. But now into the upper atmosphere, I really don't need them, so I drop them when I stage the two radial boosters. Filling the ocean with toxic debris, just another service the KSC provides. In addition to the forward docking port, I also have two radially mounted ones. Remember, I still do have to get my crew up here. The radial tanks will stay attached as there is no engine on the central core. In the end, I parked this into a 120 kilometer circular orbit tweaked my inclination down as close to zero as I could get, and then went on to the mission that I started this episode with. Okay, we're about 100 meters away. I think it's going to be time to sort of select our target. So we've got to select the docking port on the target vehicle to be our target. Kind of frustrating sometimes. Right click on there, come on, there it is. Okay, set as target. And then we want to set the control point, our control point, to be our docking port. So we'll select that and say control from here. There we go. And I want to adjust my trajectory. No, I'm going to have to go the other way. I want my trajectory to go north of that target vehicle. There we go. What's she doing? Yeah, now I do have a nav or a mod called, there it is called dock, uh, nav ball docking alignment indicator and it's putting on that little red icon it's well it's exactly what it says on the tin doesn't it so that little red icon indicates the docking port you can even line up your rotation with it if you want it's a nice simple little add-on now I'm really used to a mod called docking alignment indicator which does provide a lot more information I think I should move backwards a bit, which is up on the screen. Make sure I come above it. 
Um, but I thought I'd give this a go, you know, be a little bit more stock-like, but I think there needs to be something in addition to what stock provides for docking, which, let's face it, is nothing. <laughs> Uh, so this is my first time trying it with just this little docking port here, so I guess I gotta do quite a bit more eyeballing. Oh, I can see the target icons now just appearing on the nav ball, so that's representing the target docking port. So I gotta get myself moving in that direction. I think I'm moving in that direction. If I can get myself to like and see the prograde, oh, there it is! There's the pro. If you see the prograde icon or the retrograde icon, then all you need to do is line them up. And oh wait, wait, wait! I'm just blowing by the target. Shoot, shoot, shoot! I got it. Ah! Shoot! I hit M instead of N to back up, and I went to map view. Oh, I'm really making a hash job of this. <laughs> okay, so I blew right by the target. Oh dear. All right. Let's see if I can get myself back where I'm going. Of course, I've lost all the icons now on the nav ball, so again, I'm back to eyeballing where I'm going. Oh, wait, the target icon's not getting towards the center of the nav ball, so that means I'm not as lined up as I think I am. Nope. <laughs> oh, dear. Damn 2D screen! Okay, I can see my prograde icon on the nav ball. That's helped. So oh, back up, back up, back up. Now it's retrograde. That's okay. What I want to see is the target, the purple target icon. There it is, down there towards the bottom of the nav ball. So now if I can get the retrograde icon my ship icon and the target icon all to be in a line, that means I'm going in the right direction. There we go. So now the target icon is coming in closer and when it's in the center of the nav ball I'm all lined up and then I can thrust forward. Shoot. Oh my god. Oh, I'm not being too impressive here. There! There! There it is. Okay. I think I need to come a little more this way. Push that target. No, no, no. I'm going the wrong way. There. there. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't say that was smooth as silk, but I guess I got the job done. Man, I got to practice this some more. I got too used to all the assists I used to have installed. Well, with that done, let's get our crew. This is a vessel that you're going to be seeing a lot of in the near future. It's going... Oh, hang on. What happened? Bob! Bill! What happened to my textures? This isn't my Bob and Bill. From the opening credits, you may have noticed that I have upgraded to version 1.3.1, so that means upgrading all the mods, but clearly something has gone wrong texture replacer mod because I usually have different facial textures for Bob and Bill. Well, figuring this out will have to be for later. As I was about to mention, the time has come in this campaign for a vessel, the primary purpose of which is to ferry Kerbals up and down from low Kerbin orbit. We'll look at the vessel in detail in a moment, but I want to draw some attention to this lifter which I have dug my 1.25 meter heavy and saved in the sub-assembly in the vehicle assembly building. From here on, payloads in the range of 2 to 4 tons will likely be lifted by this guy. And that's booster separation. As we complete our low orbit insertion, let's take a closer look at the vehicle. Never underestimate the uses of monopropellant. It's not just for RCS, and is often a fine choice for a primary propellant too, especially if the vehicle isn't too large and the Delta V requirements are fairly small. What makes it attractive is its light weight, starting with the pair of O10 Puff monopropellant fuel engines, which only weigh 90 kilograms each. The weight savings translate to the fuel too, meaning that those two small spherical tanks, along with the monoprop and the command capsule, provide 383 meters per second of delta V, which is plenty for getting about in low orbit. 
It also means that you don't need separate fuel containers for the propulsion and then for the RCS. One oversight on my part, I didn't put any batteries or solar generation on this thing, so I best turn off the SAS to conserve power. Uh, electricity is still going down a little faster than I'd like. Best kill the lights too. And I'll have to rectify this with future versions of this vessel. Well, clearly we're on our way to the station? Can I call this a station? Sure, why not? We're under half a kilometer away. I think I can put the lights back on. We're on the night side again, but those flashing amber lights are lighting up our docking port fairly well. You can see that it is a ventrally mounted docking port. That is, it's on the underside of the ship, leaving the nose of the capsule free for a parachute. And besides, I think it looks good there. All right, we're almost 100 meters away. Let's reduce our relative velocity down to about a meter per second. Start getting ready for docking. And there, we're just about there, a little bit slower, okay. There it is. All right, and then we'll select our docking port as our control point, which obviously changes the nav ball around because it completely changes the orientation of which way's forward now. Now the docking port's actually facing me. This should make this easier. Come on, where is it? There, there it is. Okay, set as target. Well, there's our icon here, and we'll adjust our alignment. Let's uh. We'll turn this way so that we'll be in line with the with the station when we dock. I, I like this little docking alignment thing on the nav ball. I think this is simple but useful. Okay, so I want to get that target icon, the docking port icon, and the prograde icon all lined up. Boy, every time I do a lateral thrust, it's really jumpy. <laughs> I think I just have too many thruster blocks for such a small ship. Let's uh, turn down the thrust limiter on that. Okay, that's 48%, so I gotta make sure this one is the same to keep everything balanced. 47.9, there, 48%. All right, let's check on the rest of these. Oh, that's 48%, oh yes. Thank you, Symmetry. <laughs> I think they're all 48% now. Yes, they are, all right, awesome. Let's cut so we're a little bit closer. Oh, the target icon's not moving too much. Let's see if we move the prograde vector closer to it. I want the target icon more towards the center of the nav ball. Or actually, I will eventually want it right exactly on the center. Still doesn't seem to be moving. Should I maybe have it what happens if I put the prograde vector over to the other side? Copy over there. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, no, no. This is clearly worse. <laughs> I'm going in the wrong direction now. Get back, get back, get back. There we go. Okay, now we're going the right way. Okay, less than 20 meters from the docking port. Let's adjust our... Let's see what's going on in here now. I got everything all lined up, I think. Or not, line, not lined up, but I got the three vectors lined up right. The target vector, the port vector, and the prograde vector. Oh, now I can see that target icon coming towards the center, so I'll start bringing in the prograde vector too. Just with some lateral thrusts. Getting in about five meters to go. And that purple target icon is almost exactly in the middle. Once it's exactly in the middle again, we are all lined up. And then I'm going to want to put the prograde vector right on top of all the other two vectors and just ride this in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we got this. And there we go. We are in, oh my goodness. 
It is so small compared to everything else here. How about you? It seems kind of leech-like to me, <laughs> like it's stuck on the side of a fish or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, Jab and company now have everything they need to start their mission. And I was going to end this episode here. When I got back to the KSC, I was reading my milestones, and I got two milestones here. First ones here is that I've started construction on the first station about Kerbin. See, I told you it was a station. And we also performed a docking maneuver on Kerbin. On Kerbin? No, maybe above Kerbin, not on Kerbin. But you know, it was the station milestone that reminded me of something. I do have a station contract. And I've yet to fulfill a contract for this episode. I've not done an episode yet where I've not fulfilled at least one contract. So I gotta go for it. Let's fill, let's do the station contract. This is another of these three crew fairies. I really should give this thing a name. Curious? Nah, I always do that. I'll think of something later. Let's get to the contract. I do have a station building contract. It's gotta have an antenna docking ports and power generation, I've got that covered. And it needs to support at least nine Kerbals, and once this is docked, I'll have room for 11, so check. And the last requirement is to be able to hold 4,000 units of liquid fuel, which the fuel barge can do. So just the addition of this little orbiter should finish this off. I have fixed this thing up a bit, adding 200 units of electrical storage, solar panels, and a probe core so it can fly autonomously which is obviously useful now, but may prove useful later too, as I might not always have a pilot around. Man, look at all these ships in low orbit. Two of them are more rescues I gotta do, and I got another rescue about the moon, but right now the mission is just to get to the station. I guess the station's gonna need a name too. Well, the last free docking port is on the other side, so I'm going to have to push the retrograde vector towards the blue on the nav ball. This will have me passing on the planet side of the station. And as this is now the third docking of this episode, I won't be talking about target icons and all that kind of stuff anymore. I'll just, we'll just watch this in, uh, in fast motion. At least it feels like... I'm starting to get used to working without docking alignment indicator again. But I do really like that little icon on the nav ball. That is such a simple thing and it's really useful. Really kind of should be a stop thing in my humble opinion. And we are just about there. There we go. All right, that should be it, and oh, wait a second. My contract didn't go green. Have 4,000 units of liquid fuel in your station. Oh man, I misread this. I have to actually have the fuel, not just the capacity to hold the fuel. Shoot. Well, on the upside, you can see I got my textures sorted out. Bob and Bill are back to looking the way I'm used to them looking like. Okay, I actually do have 2,195 units of liquid fuel. Okay, so I gotta send up more fuel. But I'm out of docking base. <laughs> In the meantime, let's christen this new vessel. Oh, you are no longer gonna be called Mission 25. You are now the Ares. Uh, 25M. <laughs> gotta stick a number on there. There we go, except... Uh, I know what I'll do with that contract. I'm gonna send my crew off on their mission, which starts with them going to the moon, and while they're gone, there'll be a free docking port that I'll use to dock another fuel barge and get my 4,000 plus units of fuel. The contract should then be completed upon their return. But from the length of this video, this is going to have to be for the next episode. It's gonna be a busy one, but in the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.